Maureen Carew spoke at Women of Destiny's meeting, the Women's Ministry of WHCC South Norwood, titled Equipping the Help Meets. We trust you'll be blessed. So as I dive in um, into what I believe that God has laid in my heart to share with us today, the first thing that I want us to look at is since the, the, the heading is equipping the help needs, there are two key words that come up from there. The first one is equipping, the second one is help meet. And so I want us to look at the word help meet. Where did it first occur in the Bible so that then we begin to understand what really um, God is speaking to us about? So if we open our Bibles, please, to Genesis chapter 2. Verses 18 to 23. I will read because I'm not going to read everything. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a few key verses just to sort of bring home what I believe God wants us to get from here. So, chapter 2, 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help me for him. Um, before then, let me just read 17 just to get this into context. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This was God speaking to Adam. And then in verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmate for him. If we hold that, that's the first place that we, you know, that word help me occurred in the Bible. And when we look at the context, God was speaking to Adam. He and he, as they normally do, were having fellowship. And God had given him his assignment already. You know, you would till the ground, you would do this, you would look after this garden. And then God being God... And he looked at the situation and thinking, hmm, I really don't think Adam should be alone. I think I should make him somebody um, to keep him company. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, um, Bible scholars will make us understand that Elohim talks about three in one. I, I'm thinking to myself, maybe God just thought, you know what, I'm enjoying fellowship where I am. Why should he be alone? You know, there's nobody that is actually like him, just like I have where I am. And so God, who is the provider, thought, okay, I will make somebody for Adam, just like I have within me, God in three persons, one triumph God, and he wanted to make company for Adam. And so we're just going to read down Verse 21, and, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. 23, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So like I said, I looked at that scenario and I'm like, okay, so God, what is the purpose for a healthy? Because that's the real reason why we're here. And a lot of times, I've heard Miles Morrow say this, he says, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. So now we're going to ask ourselves, why did God make me why did he make a woman? So now we understand the context. Adam was alone. And God said, I'm going to take somebody from him. Just like the triumph God is three people in one. Adam is two people in one person. And so when God took the woman out of him, it means that he cannot actually be a whole person anymore without me. That's why it is somebody suitable to him. Somebody that is going to fit into his life. 
somebody that is going to fit into him so that he can be the complete person that he's going to be. Because it means that all along, that woman was inside Adam. And so God now said, I'm going to actually make you physical. And when you look at it, it's the same thing that happened to God. You know, the triumph in one person, then it was time for Jesus Christ to come in the physical. And when Jesus came, what did he do? He submitted to the will of the Father. Did he not? The Bible said the word came. He became flesh. He dwelt amongst us. And in the book of Hebrews, it says, Lo, it is written of me, and I come as it is written of me, to do thy will. And so, when we begin to look into the context of how the woman came into being, we begin to see that actually, we are on an assignment from God. And that's what makes us special. That's why we are valuable in the sight of God. Because he had an intention, he had a purpose in mind when he created us. We were not accidents. It wasn't just like, okay, all right. He actually thought about it and he brought it. He didn't just pick something up from somewhere and like an afterthought. He actually took time to take us out of a human being and say, I'm going to make a replica of this person. So we were inside Adam all along. And then he brought us out and he took us and he made us. And then now he gave that assignment to the two of them. So it means that both of us have specific roles that we need to play. We each have what God has purposed in his heart and mind for us to accomplish here on earth. But before I take that further, I want us to look at the word equip. When I went into the dictionary, what did I put my glasses on? Okay. <laughs> when I went into the dictionary, the... Um, Meaning that I felt fitted into what I want was from Collins English Dictionary. And it gave me two options. The first one, if you equip a person with a, a person or thing with something, you've given them the tools or equipment that are needed. The second meaning, it says if something equips you for a particular task or experience, it gives you the skills and attitude you need for it, especially by educating you in a particular way. And so I want us to see this afternoon as being equipped with not just skills, but attitude. Because our attitude towards a thing matters a lot, how we will use that particular thing. If you think something is of value to you, you will treat it with care, with love. You won't just throw it anywhere. My husband and I were always telling our children, I said, if it's your bo uh, toy, uh, game boy or whatever, we see the way you keep those things. But if it's your book, we throw it anywhere. If it's your clothes, it doesn't matter much to you. But if it is gay, I mean, that slip will disappear. But when it comes to, let's study. Oh, mom. And then we are telling you, okay, walk around, go and wash your face. We don't do that when it's game time. Because game has priority in your life. And so, this afternoon, God has said, I want you to have the skill and the right attitude towards you being a helpmate. I just wanted us to have that background at the back of our minds. And so, going on from the purpose of God. So, now we ask ourselves, what is the purpose of a woman? It is that... God has made this garden and put the man in there. And then he took us out of Adam. So we were inside Adam already doing the same assignment that God had given to him. But then he says, okay, I want two pairs of hands now, not just a pair of hands. I want two pairs of legs to walk around. And I want two pairs of eyes to see things. And so it doesn't mean that we're inferior. Because you see, this is, this is why I'm not a feminist. Because I don't have a battle that I'm fighting. But unfortunately, there are some Christian women who feel that we're emancipated. We, you know, we, we need to get liberated. 
um, you know, the, the, the Bible is too sexist or, you know, it, it's um, predominantly male in the language that it uses. And there's been a lot of things going on, even as Christian women, that people have lost the purpose for which they are created. Um, I was listening to Miles Monroe again, and he was talking about how the role of the women has changed over years and causing a lot of problems. Because, you know, in the olden days, I look at my mom. She, I mean, she, she even said, she said, when she was young, she used to pray that she would um, be a housewife. I doubt if there will be anybody here who will want to be. Although I always say to my husband, honey, just tell me to sit down at home, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I may be one out of how many, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is, we've gotten into that culture where everybody thinks, you know, I have the right to go out to work or, you know, um, I'm, I'm okay if it's, uh, for, you know, we're Nigerians. If it's Gary that we have to eat as long as everybody is happy I'm fine but not to digress what I'm trying to say is a lot of times we have allowed the culture of the world to enter into the church that we have forgotten the purpose for which God created us and God made us and so as I was preparing this God said to me I want you to take specific individuals in the Bible that had the helper role so that maybe that will also help us to begin to see how that role is supposed to play out in our lives. And the first individual that I want us to look into is Aaron, Moses' brother, and how he came on the scene. If we open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 4, 14 to 16. And the anger of the Lord, so this was Moses giving God different excuses why he's not going to go on this assignment that God wants for him. And now, the Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. Please, I want us to make note of this. This is the job description of Aaron. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall, and he shall be even... He shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. Now, I'm not trying to say that your husband is a God. But I just want us to see the role that Aaron was playing, or that God had assigned Aaron to play in the life of Moses. Moses said, I can't do this job that you have given me to do. And God said, okay, I've appointed somebody who is going to help you with this work. And we saw how Aaron did that. Now when Aaron tried to usurp that authority, we also saw what happened. First of all, when he made the uh, golden calf, we saw how, you know, it was only the tribe of Levi that survived that earthquake that happened and swallowed up some people, you know. Again, when he and Miriam began to murmur and say, oh, is, is it only him? Like some of us do. Why should you be the one who, every time it's your decision, why should we go with what you want? I've done it. I don't know about you. Maybe some of you are holier than me. But we've all grumbled. We've all murmured. You know, and wondered whatever. And we saw what happened. And God said, okay, don't, no problem. Put two rods there. The one that bought will know the person that God has anointed and appointed. And we know what happened. Unfortunately, Miriam didn't even you know, she became a leper all throughout her life. That's an individual. The second individual that I want us to look into her life is Abigail. And that we will find in First Samuel 25. First Samuel 25.
We all know the story of Nabal, I hope, because I won't be reading the, um, the whole thing. Um, Nabal had a wife called uh, Abigail, and um, David came to Nabal and said, um, can you give us some food to eat? Uh, when your shepherds were feeding the sheep and you know, doing all that, we saw gangs of people who, you know, moraders as they call them, and they would have attacked them but we you know they actually attacked and we helped out and you know we sorted out this problem for you in those days it's not strange that such requests be made so it wasn't something that david was doing out of the fact that okay i've been anointed as king that's usually how people would come you know i mean when you think about when abraham um what, you know was hospitable towards angels it wasn't that he knew they were angels he just said please you know, you need to come and, you know. So that was the culture in those days where people would go and say, oh, we helped out. Can you help me? And that was true because when it became a problem and David wanted to attack Nabal, the servants quickly went to Abigail to say, actually, these people helped us. And, you know, your husband being a foolish man that he is, this is what he has done. And so the wife now rose to the occasion. Now, why um, did God say for us to speak about Abigail because she moved in godly wisdom you know um, for us to be able to fit into the lives of our husbands we need to be women who are wise you know Lady Nana, you, uh, you, you mentioned that verse of scripture when you were praying which was a powerful prayer time by the way Psalm 127 verse 1 says a wise woman builds her home but a foolish one pulls it down we need to realize that the role or the assignment that God has given us is to be a home builder. We are the ones that put things together. And I want us to look at how Abigail approached David. We'll just take some specific verses because I can see my time is running out already. First Samuel. When we start, we start from 14. 25. So that was, so, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers, blah, blah, blah. And I just want us to go to, let me see, 24. Aha. And fell at his feet, that David's feet, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me. You know? And that was somebody who mm-hmm. knew immediately that something needed to be done and was there quick to be able to. But I want to believe that it's not only that she is a wise woman, she's also a godly woman. Because that was intercession. Intercession means you take the place of the person that you're praying for. That was deep intercession. And then, not only did she, you know, take care of the situation, when she got home, she told her husband, unfortunately, I suppose, the husband came under God's judgment, and the Bible said, instead of him to repent, just like Judas, the Bible said he was just quiet and then after 10 days he died. I guess God was just like, Abigail deserves better. Why am I sharing this? You know, I mean, by the grace of God, I know, you know, all of us here. But peradventure we know someone who is in a relationship that they feel that this man is ungodly. This is an assurance that God takes care of business. So you may come across the person because, you know, I didn't want to take it for granted that it's just all of us. God covers everybody. And when he laid this on my heart, I believe that it's for those people who they feel that they're in a relationship that the man is difficult to, uh, you know, live with. I, I can't submit to him. He's so heady. He doesn't want to hear. He doesn't want to listen. If a woman like Abigail could do something that would, you know, save a whole household. How she had the grace to live with that man, only God knows. Mm-hmm. But she had, I mean, it would not be the first time. That's why the servant went to her. It would not be the first time that she had come, mm-hmm. you know, to save a situation on behalf of her husband. What about us? So we need to begin to reflect. What do we do in a situation where we feel that our husband is being unreasonable? Do we just throw up our hands in the air 
or do we take counsel from God and move into that situation and bring a solution? The last person and not the least that God laid on my heart is the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus says, I'm going and I'm going to give you a comforter, a helper. And God said, begin to look at the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And one thing that God said to me, let's quickly look into it and then we will talk and then we will end. John chapter 16, the gospel according to John 16, 12 to 15. I have yet many things. This is Jesus saying to his disciples. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. That's the key place. He shall not speak of himself. And then going on he says, But whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak, and he will show you things to come. And I believe God was saying to me, he will not speak of himself, meaning he will not push himself forward. What did um, our foremother do? <laughs> she pushed herself forward because she was not the first, the person, you know, she was not made when God gave the assignment to Adam. The devil now came, did God see? How many of us here did we not, do we not go? I know the man is the head though, but did the Bible really say that's when we look for the Greek meaning of the me and the Hebrew meaning and the Aramaic and all of the above just for that particular moment so that we can get some comfort. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will take of me and give to you. That's our rule. We take of God to give to our husband. When we look at the Holy Spirit, you know, the Bible, Jesus said, He said, He will not speak of Himself. If we really look at it, this struggle, this struggle in our home is really about self. It's about what about me? Mm -hmm. What about me? Who's going to look after me? Mm -hmm. Who's going to look after my concerns? Who cares about me? My husband comes, he demands, he takes. The children come, he demands, he takes. What about me? And I remember there was one experience that I had. Um, I'd just come back from work. I was really tired and I looked at the house and I realized, mm, nobody will even notice all this one that we're able to do. And, you know, God corrected me and I changed my attitude. And I really thank God that he did because my husband came through the desert. Oh, thank you so much, dear. And he was so appreciative. And I was like, ah, I would have missed that word. Thank you very much. But what I'm trying to say here is, if we really see the role that God has given us, the place that he wants us to play in the life of our husband, and we are satisfied, because one thing that God said to me is that the root of all this thing is that we are discontented. You know, the Bible says, godliness plus contentment is great thing. What the devil wants us to do is to be discontented with our position. He will come and say, did God say? Is it really true? Should the situation be like this? And he will paint a lot of picture. And then when discontentment comes, remember in the book of Isaiah, he talks about how the, the devil has fallen. Lucifer fell. Why? Because Lucifer went, I will, I will, I will, I will. He wanted to raise himself above God. Now, God has told us this is our job description. Are we content with where God has placed us? Because if we allow this contentment to come in, we will fall out of love with our husband and we will go after somebody else's husband. Trust me. You may not know it. You know, I have an aunt. She has, uh, she does these talk shows and she was telling me about an experience. One of the people that around her, this person was a pastor. And she had a shop. She and her husband, you know, it's so easy to be honest with you to fall out of love with your husband. So this particular guy comes into the shop to come and, you know, and before long, this woman realized that she had begun to look forward to this person coming. 
without realizing. And now it has become an emotional crush. To the extent that she confessed to my aunt that when her husband was making love to her, she could only enjoy it because she had a picture of this person in her mind. There are many women that are committing that. I'm talking of Christians now. I'm not talking of because we're speaking to ourselves as women. There are many women that are committing adultery. They may not be doing it physically, but if your heart has left your husband and he's no longer the sugar in your tea, <laughs> the cockroach in your cup, <laughs> then we are committing for adultery. So we need to watch our heart. There are some mornings, and unless you want, I don't know about you, before I took control of my home, there will be some mornings that I'm just like, oh, you know what, this marriage thing is, I think I'm tired. I don't know about you. And it took God to open my eyes to make me understand how I fitted into my husband's life. And then I took control of my home and I said, you know what, Satan knows. I think it was you I was saying to you that every morning I pray. Lord, my husband will not look at another woman. Me too, I will not look at another woman. This home, ah, by fire, by force. You have to do that. You have to fight for your home. You see this thing called emotion? We cannot depend on it, my sister. We cannot. I mean, one morning, even when you look at yourself, one morning you love yourself, another day you don't love yourself. Can you depend on emotion? You can Marriage is a commitment. You tell yourself, I am committed to this. If we're looking for when we will feel fine, I'm telling you, we will not last long in marriage. It's not possible. I have to make up my mind that I will begin to think good thoughts about my husband. I will think good thoughts about my children. Because it, there was just one day, I just realized that whenever I go to pick up my children in school, the first thing is, don't do the bad, the hair, the, ah, then I told myself, he. What is going on? I want to love my children. I want, you know. So do you know what I do? I prepare my heart from work. That Lord, when I see my children today, we're going to be just loving each other. And what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the word of God. Not by Oprah, because we can renew our mind by Oprah. We can renew our mind by Yanda Vanset or whatever it's her name. The word of God is what renews our mind. We have to make up our mind. You know, when I was, when I was single, I had a, a mentor. She used to say to me, Maureen, you know, first of all, she told me, let's go, ask God to give you the picture of a woman he wants you to be. I did that half heartedly. You know how we... <laughs> then she said to me, if your husband likes okra and you like obono, you have to pray, God, give me a Auntie, please, don't even go there. Each person will eat their own now. I don't mind cooking both. He <laughs> will eat his own crop. He will eat my own crop. But I tell you what. If I'm going to fit in as God has made me to fit into his life, then honestly, eating or eating or crop is not too big a price. We need God to give us the vision of the home that He has for us. I cannot fit into what we share God's life. You are the one that God has made for you to fit into. I cannot fit into Mr. Bamford's life. He made you to fit into me. Our job is to go to God and say, How do you want me to fit into my husband's life? What exactly do you want me to do? You know? It, it wasn't normal. It, it, it wasn't an, a usual thing for me to um, ask my father, so what is it you want me to do? Until God opened my eyes. And I realized that, do you know what? Un, until my husband is fulfilled, I really can't be fulfilled. And that's the honest truth. Because we've been caught from the same cloth. I'm supposed to fit into that. And the more I put his desires above mine, the more he's looking after my own desire. And I'm like, why did I waste all my years mm-hmm. fighting for my life mm-hmm. when it was just there for me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes I'm like, hey God, what is this? What is going on? 
you just wonder, can somebody really love like this? But you have to realize that God had to bring you to that place where you say, you know what? Not my will, but yours be done. I said to myself, ambition, you have to die. Ambition, you have to die. And a lot of us that are career women, you know, our ambition sometimes is a stumbling block to us having a harmonious home. You know, I want to achieve this. I remember when I was going to do my MBA. My husband and I, we sat down and we said, if we don't do it, this is the window of opportunity. If you don't do it, you can never do it. It took the two of us to agree. When we heard that somebody made a decision without telling the husband, I was like, hey, does that still happen in Christian homes? Because it became strange to me because of where God has helped me to get to. You know, that's why they said, when you see the glory out of the story, it took me dying to who Maureen was. You know? Mm. It took me dying to myself my desires and whatever. And as I said, okay, God, this job that you have given me, my husband and my children, I'm going to do it to the glory of your name. Then it was like the tables turned. And what I've been looking for all these years and fighting was just there for me to enjoy. And now they wait on me like I'm Queen Sheba and I'm like, okay, Lord, thank you. You know, so I want to leave this with us today as we go into the word of God. I just want us to read Proverbs 31 and I'm not going into the normal, usual, you know, virtuous woman, whatever, whatever. I just want to drop something that God laid on my heart. Proverbs 31 and then we will round up. Um, let me start from 30, 20, it's 28, is right? Yes, it's 28. I can't even see well with these glasses. Her children rise up. So this is after all her accomplishments. The husband is sitting at the gate. You know, then the uh, the the rest of the proverb says, "Her children, twenty-eight. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praised her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And that's where I want us to end today. I'm sure many of us want our husbands to praise us. You know, we don't want contention in our home. The reason why this woman was able to accomplish all the things that were before them was for one reason. She feared the Lord. My sister, the way to our husband's heart is not even true food. You know, they say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. A woman that fears the Lord. What does the Bible say? It says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. I spoke about Abigail. The way she wisely took care of the situation. If God is number one in our life, everything, that's what I want to seek for the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then every other thing will be added. I am an heir. Uh, and example of every other thing will be added. When I said to God, I said, okay, God, everything, I'm even going to forget everybody. God is number one. And I began to yield to the Lord. I am reaping the dividends today. A woman that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Not just, you know, the Bible says, the husband and the children. What is it that we're looking for in life? You know, I'm sure... I mean, there are some times when my husband is praising me and I'm like, really? What did I even do? And I'll try to downplay. And then he will come here and say, hey, God, <laughs> but for your grace, Father. <laughs> and you see, and when, when things like that happen, to be honest, now I understand why the Bible doesn't ask us to pray for the I know we do. Lord, keep me humble. But honestly, when you know where God has picked you from, when you can see your story, you cannot be found. Because you know you didn't do this. You know it wasn't because I was wise oh, and I quickly did this. No. It is by yielding to the Holy Spirit. It is by yielding to the Holy Spirit. It starts with the fear of God. When the fear of God is in our heart, then we will listen to Him. And then we will be like Joseph. Even when, you know there was a time when I used to do things for that with my husband. Eh? <laughs> but 
when God got hold of me, he now became like Joseph said. How can I do this great thing against God? So it wasn't against my husband anymore. Because I realized that my assignment is from God. Yeah. I'm going to give an account of my home. How I ran it to God. So it wasn't just this man. It was hey, this treasure that you have given me to look after. My children weren't just like, oh, you know. They were like, wow, I have a job to do in there. I have a job to do in my husband's life. And so I took my directives from God. So it's not according to if he prays with me today, if he's upset with me tomorrow. It's I'm constant. Why? Because God is constant. And because I am rightly and fully connected to him, my source of supply does not run dry. So as we bow down our heads, and you know, I, <laughs> when I was sharing with my husband, I said, So, what about people who are looking to God to get married? And I said, Just like we kept those seeds of words in our heart, I trust that those who are also looking to the Lord will begin to treasure this word. I know that by the grace of God, there were a lot of things that I also left over because I had learned some things from people who had gone ahead. You know, and we always have our resources around us. So I'm trusting that God is also preparing you yeah. so that those issues will not come up as you know strongly as they did in our lives because you've been blessed to hear these words. So as we bow down our heads, you know, to pray, let's just begin to ask the Lord, Father, give me a revelation of your purpose for me in my husband's life. How do you want me to fit into him? How do you have you made me suitable for him alone? You know, when we look at the woman, Proverbs 31 woman, the Bible says her husband's heart trusts in her. Can you really say that your husband trusts If you're not able to say that, you know, and be... Uh, Confident that your husband has trust in you, then that's something that you need to pray about. You know, God, you have a specific purpose for me in my husband's life. I'm asking for your grace. I'm asking for your supply so that I can fit into his life the way you want me to, so that I can be that helper that you have asked me to be. This is an assignment from God now. It's not, oh, you know, I met and we fell in love and here we are today, we don't know what to do. Lord, this is the task that you have given me. You know, God always equips us with everything. So, Lord, my attitudes, I submit them unto you so that you can take over. Help me to be content with the spouse that you have given me and see him through your eyes, not through my eyes. If we look with ordinary eyes, there are lots of things that we'll be discontented about. Because no one is perfect, not even us.